Uh, it is now time for the Future Politics Panel. The Future Politics Panel. Well, I'm delighted to say, joining me this morning, Luke Hilljard, who's clearly only 20, and <laughs> and also Ben Coat, who's a political writer and commentator. Good morning to the two of you. Good morning. Really good to see you. Um, obviously, we'll start with Israel, if we if we may, and and I obviously we know what's going on over there. There are lots of other stories. Georgie and I spoke about this one this morning, and I just want to get your take, really, on, on where we are in this country, that question I'm asking about, do people recognise this country? Are they worried about this country and and particularly this article this morning saying supporters of an extremist Islamist group that said Muslims were overjoyed at the massacre of 1,400 people in Israel have been targeting young Moscowers with hateful material this comes at, amazingly come out of Sadiq Khan's office uh, if essentially it's an official review drawn up last year found that an imam in the capital had raised concerns about members of his but Tahir sharing hateful material and producing hateful rhetoric outside the mosque essentially we've got here um, Ben we've got uh, the idea that young Muslims really impressionable are being told stuff sold religious zealotry and indoctrination I think these these individual cases are they're, they're definitely concerning. We we don't want to see young people exposed to things that that could potentially push them towards extremism. But I think the broader point here for me is that I've been I've been very proud of how this country has reacted to to this conflict. I think there's been a lot of moderation, perhaps more moderation than we might have seen from some politicians even. So I think although there are these fringe cases, I think in general we've seen a lot of sort of liberalism and, and moderation that I think we can be proud of. In, in, what, in what sense? What, that no one's spoken out? I mean, I've heard from a lot of people who said they were there, they saw those marches, the pro-Palestine marches, they felt very afraid of what was going on. We all also saw restraint by the police. Is that a good thing, or are we concerned that the police are almost turning a blind eye to what is going on? I think if we see individual examples of um, protesters maybe supporting Hamas or other extremist uh, jihadist groups, for example, then then yes, they should they should step in. But I think we should be clear that that was that was not the majority of the protesters yesterday. So I think that we can um, we can we can be proud that that most people didn't go down that route and they they took a much more moderate line. Good. And, and Luke, and j just in terms of where we are, and obviously this was a huge march, 100,000 people, and also it, it's so complicated, and the idea, and there are people there chanting in favour of the Palestinian people, which is absolutely right and proper, because they want to be able to live uh, unobstructed lives. But at the same time, what what is your sense of those messages uh, that, that, that were chanted, um, you know, that, that essentially could be interpreted to be trying to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Yeah, I think I would agree with what Ben said, really. That, um, I mean, the organisers are claiming there were like 300,000 people there. I think the official record is 100,000. Yeah. And we are talking about, um, you know, tiny numbers of people uh, making offensive chants or, you know, celebrating the attacks or whatever. And obviously that has to be completely condemned. And I think the sort of, you know, there might be questions to ask of whether... Um, the, the police could be clamping uh, down more forcefully on that. But as Ben says, hundreds of thousands of people there, the march was for a peaceful solution to the conflict. I believe that nearly every speaker started out by thoroughly condemning the Hamas attacks and sort of emphasising the need for um, a peaceful solution for the benefits of all people in the region. Um, so I think, you know, the the... Indivi yeah, these individual cases are, um, are are concerning, and of course you're going to get loads of traffic on social media mm. from finding a clip of somebody with an offensive sign, but you're not going to get loads of traffic when somebody uh, gives a sort of balanced speech that acknowledges sort of you know both perspectives in the conflict. So I think um, you know the individual instances are concerning, but I think we we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that most people are taking a sort of balanced and reasonable. Uh, well, I mean, I think one particularly concerning one, a video clip, a speaker is filmed asking the assembled crowd, what is the solution to liberate people in the concentration camp called Palestine? In response, several men in the crowd are chanting jihad, jihad, jihad. The Metropolitan Police saying, oh, well, jihad has a number of meanings. Georgie uh, ha had a very good uh, take on that in terms of what it might mean. But I would have thought that's pretty inflammatory, given people being bottled up in a march. I'm not sure that's acceptable. 
I, I, I think my, my view would be that, that that word is is concerning. The police should probably intervene if it is used. But I think why we, didn't they? You'd have to ask them. Perhaps out of out of some some fear of of, of, of stoking stoking tensions. It is what what is clearly a very very complicated and, and fraught issue. They should. You'd hope get the full full backing of the government and the Home Secretary to, to intervene where they should. But what about if it, if the tables were turned? And, and maybe I'll come to you, George. It, what happens if it, if it was there and there were anti-Muslim chants taking place on the streets of Britain? Well, I think people would jump in far faster, wouldn't they? Uh, all I all I would ask is, what do people going on that march expect if the tables were turned on us? Had terrorists come into our country, killed babies? taken hostages, which they still hold, murdered people in their homes, what would we expect our government to do? Don't get me wrong, I'm not justifying anything that Israel... All I'm asking is for people to ask themselves that question. Is the timing of a free Palestine a march point. appropriate less than two weeks after the biggest massacre of Jewish people since the Holocaust? Is that appropriate? If it was, as you say, to unite people together, and I fundamentally agree, we do need to stop murdering innocent people. Absolutely. Constraint has to be shown in this. Someone needs to mediate. Yeah. Then bring people together. We should have had Israeli flags there. We should have had British flags there. We should have had French flags, Palestinian flags. So, so are you saying that actually global. we should have banned that kind of march and had a no, solidarity? I, no, no, I do never oh, believe so, that. But how would marches. you police that? Because it's impossible. It's not then. about policing. It's about okay, the messaging you, from people. I would that agree. I would support. agree. But also, let's just go back then to the idea that actually this is about indoctrination. There was a little girl there, five years old, who was chanting five, six, seven, eight. Israel is a terror state. She's learned that. She clearly doesn't know what she's talking about and of course she was cheered as a result of that and that emboldened her but that's because she was having a nice time and and this is what we have to clamp down on this is why I'm getting such kickback from people saying I don't recognize this country that yeah I, I, I saw that clip and, and it was definitely concerning I think but yeah I, I would once again sort of we should take the bigger picture here. There was a there was a much more broader peaceful protest that was going on, Indeed. and and I think also that you know that that the the march there that's one part of this country. That is not the people have many different views there. There will be different different protests, different demonstrations, and I think that's a good thing. And, and just in terms of, of the tube, did you see this bro broadcast on the tube? We played it earlier. I don't know if we've got it. Um, the clip here is actually ready. Let's just see. So this was people on the tube going to this march. I agree that um, this is a march in favour of of uh, the, looking after the Palestinian people. But at the same time, it appears the driver of the tube took matters into his own hands and chanted the words free, free, at which point people chanted back. Here's the clip. He chants free, free, they chant Palestine will be free. If that is the driver, TFL says it is investigating, it sounds remarkably like the driver to me. If it was the driver, is that acceptable? I think... <laughs> Probably not. I don't think. Probably we, not. Well, I don't think we want to be. I don't think it's terribly important. I mean, it's. It's, it's just, really it's important. A, it's just free Palestine. It's no, not it's like really saying, important. This is on public transport. If you're the, Jewish on that tube and you hear free, free, Pal oh, free, free Palestine, it's not acceptable, is it? On but, public transport. Free, well, I mean, I don't think. I suppose it's a political opinion that somebody who's. So you know, therefore, is that are we allowing political opinions well, from tube drivers? Well, well I think. Pro, you know, I would say probably not. Actually. Probably, I don't think. Well, I think it's you know, either acceptable. Or it's not. Well, def you know, define a political opinion. People have chats about politics You're at work the whole this. time. No, no, I think <laughs> I just don't think it's that big a deal. He's yes, sort of, it's it's a tube driver ben, getting, big, up, getting involved with the, you if know that, some passengers if on that the train. Is the tube it, all, it, it hardly sounds. It hardly sounds hostile. It's not like he's saying anything sort of confrontational or aggressive. He's, he is supporting a political cause. I, it's the sort of thing that I, you know, I can't believe it's a sort of big news story. I think it's the sort of thing where you sort of take him aside and have, have a word and say, you know, don't do that. I don't think it's a sort right. of anything bigger than that. Are we worried that people are encased in a metal tube where you have someone quoting political slogans, which is what that is, if that was the driver, 
Should we be concerned or is it not a big deal? I think I'd be inclined to agree with, with Luke here, actually. I think that he, he shouldn't be expressing political opinions here. I think... Um, but, but I, I do think it, it is probably more a matter for for TfL rather than rather than police. I, th I think that they should mm. they, they, they should intervene here. That, you know whether I, I'm not even sure something like that would necessarily if it's a first offence whether that should be a, a sacking offence. I think they should have a word with him and, and hopefully it is. I am it. gobsmacked, Georgie. <laughs> Look, I, I welcome I welcome <laughs> different views from across the. Uh, Where are you going with this? I don't agree with you. Basically, <laughs> no, no, I don't. No, what. All all I would say to that is, I mean, it's all very... Is anybody here Jewish? No. no, no. Has anybody here got family and friends in Israel? I do. I, 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 I'm sorry, I just find that very, very antagonistic. The Tube, actually, as a woman, doesn't always feel the safest place to be. So imagine if you had some sort of chant. I don't know whether this was actually from a loud... I actually sort of think it probably wasn't from the driver. I think it sounds like a loud speaker. It may the be. Because who can hear what well, the, the driver says? Well, and also, let me just say, to be fair to TfL, TfL has said we're committed to providing a safe yeah. network for everyone. Uh, we want to make it clear that London... I have to finish. London is open to everyone. We are aware of footage circulating on social media that suggests political comments have been made by one of our tube drivers. We're working to scrutinise the footage and ensure the circumstances are urgently investigated. That's TfL. And I agree with them. So the tube needs to be a safe place to be. I, I was also a sports journalist, and so I've been on, you know, packed sports. It can be a very intimidating place to be. So if you feel like someone of authority is therefore giving you a message, it is very loaded at this time when people are still wanting their family, still grieving. Mm. There are bodies still warm in graves. Can we not make this? And it is political. It is political when you make a thing like, and it makes people uncomfortable. I was just, the tube I, needs to be I, I was just, sorry, Ben, you were going to jump in. But I welcome in. views. I, I, so, so for sure, it's a political statement. But I think it potentially is an interesting thought experiment. What if this was another political issue? What if it was Black Lives Matter, for example? Not acceptable. I, I agree, it wouldn't be acceptable, but I think there would be significantly less outrage, and I think it would, again, be an issue for TfL rather than the police because, again, and look national at, media. look at the context of what we're talking about. Can I get just, anybody listen to, honestly, the podcast from Barry Rice? There's an amazing podcast about the, the horrors that happened on Oct October the 7th. Just, that's the context in which we... we, we in this, right? This isn't just normal free Palestine protest, which absolutely you have every right to protest. So, so can this I just in the context of this? Only let two let weeks. me just add a little more to this. A Hamas fugitive who ran the group's terrorist operations in the West Bank and served on its ruling body lives in a council property in London, which mm. he's recently bought for a, with a hundred and twelve thousand pound discount. What are we doing in this country? Also, I'm just very interested in the political situation here because, just in terms of Keir Starmer and his positioning, look, he's done really well in trying to detoxify the Labour Party, moving the Labour Party more into the centre ground. But there is a lot of upset now um, when he said on another radio station on the 11th of October, Israel had the right to block power and water. Now, there's been a huge kickback from within the Labour Party. There was a documentary on last night as well about what this has done. People saying, we, uh, Muslim people are saying that, that because he's been so staunch in his defence of Israel, that actually they no longer feel that they can um, they can support Labour. Is it? Uh, is this going to be a, a defining moment, do you think? We've got, we've got different elements and factions in the Labour party he's trying desperately to unite it and he's treading on eggshells slightly well it's such a complex situation i think it is a it's very difficult as georgie's kind of been alluding to for any of us here to um you know to come up with a uh, a sort of solution in as much as the uk has any influence over or has much influence over the situation in the middle east anyway so i think um politicians of all parties are in a, a difficult position i think um, as a kind of threat to Keir Starmer's position or, or credibility as leader of the Labour Party. I think um, I don't think this is something that's going to de decide most people's votes. I mean, if you look at the op opinion polls on, on this, most people take a very nuanced position. Most people mm. don't know what they think about it. Uh, and of those that sort of sympathise more with the Palestinian side or more with the Israeli side on both on both sides they support a, a, a two-state solution with yeah. the, t the, the two I mean, sort of people. I have to get to a break. So Let me just get Ben to have a word. I mean, 72 Labour councillors have signed a letter saying they've lost confidence in him uh, as a result. A problem for Starmer or not? 
I don't think it's a significant problem. I think he's done well, as you say, to, to wrestle the party from what you could call anti-Semitism under Jeremy Corbyn. However, I think he probably did go too far in advocating what I think could be quite easily described as war crimes in, in a form of collective punishment. So I think he's probably right to start withdrawing from that stance. Interesting stuff. Chaps, thank you very much indeed. Stay exactly where you are for the moment. Time for a break then. Luke, Ben and Georgia will be back after this break. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. This is Talk Today with me, David Bull. Time 8.48 now. I'm joined by Luke Hildyard and Ben Cope. Uh, we're doing the Future Politics panel. David says, Lisa, where did you get those two wishy-washy <laughs> political commentators? Woeful behaviour. Uh, David, uh, this one from Kristen Newbury saying, thank goodness for Georgie. Your Future Politics panel is why this country is doomed. We should never be tolerant. <laughs> doomed! <laughs> We're doomed because of you two. Uh, but why should we should never be tolerant of one person on a hundred thousand pound march who supports evil, murdering terrorists? They're utterly pathetic liberals. Uh, however, I'm also being told off. I'm watching your programme this morning. I find your views inflammatory, David. People have the right to march and express their views. John in Lincolnshire says so many people with such muddled arguments. And Luke, you're wokedly stupid. The driver should be sacked. Those are just some of the messages coming in this morning. Now. Uh, let, let's just move on, if we may, and talk about what's going on in terms of uh, politics. We have a general election coming up, obviously. Uh, Labour has a, a very convincing lead at the moment. The Conservatives obviously lost three by-elections on the trot. Of course, Rishi Sunak, I keep saying as a middle manager, he doesn't have the vision, he has, doesn't have the drive. Then you've got Jeremy Hunt there, and they're determined not to give the tax breaks. They want to fix the roof or whatever it is while the sun isn't shining or whatever they've decided to use as a slogan now. Very interesting, in The Guardian this morning, Jeremy Hunt is expected to stand down as an MP before the next election, according to senior Conservatives. Mm. They say the Chancellor is aware he could suffer a Michael Portillo moment. He's put himself forward for the new Surrey constituency. This is God Orming and Ash. His South West Surrey seat was dissolved, split in 2-2. So he has put himself forward. Of course, there are catas cataclysmic predictions of wipeout for the Conservative Party. I think, actually, some very high-profile people could go, Hunt? Hans, Oliver Dowden, Penny Morden. I, I, my mouth dropped open when I read this this morning. Are you surprised? I was very surprised. It can't be a story that the Conservatives are very happy to come out on a Sunday. I, I think this has been a, a, a really significant week for them. It, it, it feels like a time when the, the penny has finally dropped that the, the polls are real. With you know that the, the, over basically since Liz Truss left office, that there hasn't been a poll bounce. That they the, the Conservatives seem to you know whether what day of the week, what the political cycle is doing to which opposition they can lose to you know anybody, anytime, anywhere. And I think that that is that is starting to to come home to them mm -hmm. and. You know, potentially they are starting to think about future careers. Well, so Rishi Sunak is now saying, "Oh, I'm thinking about some tax breaks," and and I was thinking, "Well, how about being conservative? Maybe that's the way to get some votes." <laughs> I so I find it very frustrating the the kind of tax breaks they're talking about. So whether it's abolishing inheritance tax, we heard a bit about. But that uh, would play well. I think the optics would play incredibly well. I mean, if we were listening, reading to the, the Times yesterday, they were talking about stamp duty mm -hmm. and a cut to stamp duty. Now, I think if we're talking about optics... I welcome that. I would suggest that inheritance tax is a very bad move for the Conservatives to make in the wider scheme of the population. Less, about 4% of people actually but, pay for it as Yes, but when you look at the polling, 60% support the abolition. It's one of the most hated taxes. However... It's one of the stamp, most hated taxes. Stamp, <laughs> stamp duty is obviously seen to be something that for everyone... Of course. However, young people don't really pay it. First-time buyers don't pay it up to a certain amount. And actually, it's already got ta cut in place until 2025. So it wouldn't really be playing to young voters, which is pretty much where they need to go. But I agree with you, playing to young voters isn't a concern. Well, I think the other thing is philosophy. that they need to hang on to the voters they used to have, the ones that are actually uh, disappearing off to join other parties as a result. Just in terms of that, is, is Hunt actually sensing the political waters and jumping before he's pushed? I think almost certainly. I mean, I found it quite incredible that he's, you know, they've just had this conference where he, they've got that awful slogan about, I can't even remember what it is, very clunky about taking decisions for the long term, but then he's hinted, or, or words coming out, that he might quit in a year. I uh, and I think it, yeah. it, it doesn't imply a great deal of confidence in what they're, you know, in either their electoral prospects, but also just in their 
um, long-term economic strategy. And I think, obviously, at every election, certain MPs are going to sort of think, OK, you know, this is a good time for me to stop being an MP. But for the actual chancellor who's in a you know the second most important person in the in the government to be someone who's going to be sort of stepping down in a year i i, I don't think that's very sort of you know appropriate i think you know if the, if the ship's got going down he's got to, call, to go down with it well, well, I would agree. Also, what does that say in terms of the optics of this? Is I want fiscal restraint. By the way, I'm I'm off, and I'm going to get a nice, probably a payout as a result of that. And I'll go and make some money in the private sector. It doesn't really. It doesn't look good, does it? It really doesn't. And I think. Um I think from here on in, the, the, the Conservatives are gonna, going to struggle and it'll feel like a, a very long and tired election campaign. Do they have a chance? No. Do you want to think about that? <laughs> yeah. oh. So you, you literally, you see some commentators are saying there is a possibility they can turn this round. I think, I think it's a very small possibility, but it, there is a possibility. I, I, I found it really surprising how, how many media commentators have, have, have clung to the possibility of some kind of comeback. I, I appreciate it's a good story to, to keep on going, but I just don't see any evidence of it. I don't see any likelihood. I think, I, don't, I mean, even the, the political plays that the Conservatives continue to play, positioning Sunak as, as a change candidate, seems <laughs> insane. And so all, any opportunity they have to try and resurrect themselves in, in, in some form seems to fall flat. I, I don't see any... Is there any anything either. they can do? Any measure, you think? Any place that they can target? What do you think? For, for, for me, it, I, I, I'd, base it, I'd base a campaign on the economy, I think. Because and, and not that it would necessarily not that it would necessarily work. So what's the one thing? Just answering George's question. What's the so one the thing? That would, the, the, so just sort the economy out. Because I, I think there, there is a, there is a reasonable <laughs> chance over the next year that the you know inflation falls, growth yeah, increases. Yeah, not, not somewhat. because of him though, because it's he's fought, sorry, but you know he's saying it is. Well, he's of saying him. it's him. <laughs> okay, fine. But people need to feel richer. Okay, you're going with I, the economy. I, what's the one thing he could do to turn it around? I don't think it is because of him. I think the economy will probably improve a little bit, but people aren't going to be feeling like this is some kind of golden age in a year's time. <laughs> No, I would be, agree with that. Still but is there in. one thing, just to follow on Georgie's idea, is there one thing they can do to turn this round? Yes I, don't, or no? I don't think there is. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be quite as brave as Ben in saying there's no chance. <laughs> but I think it would. It, I think there's only chance is you know some sort of massive external event happening mm. that sort of totally changes the, the political climate which can but I don't think it's anything really I don't think you know cuts to inheritance tax people have kind of made up their minds about the sort of competence of this administration and you know and its values and where it's taking us and so and so on and so forth I, I don't think there's anything they themselves can do Fantastic thank you very much to both of you Luke Hill Chiang, Director of the High Pay Centre Ben Cope Political Writer and Commentator and that was today's Future Politics Pack Future Politics Panel.